the Wake Up and Live with the Art Show with your co-hosts Christopher Fortunato and Sue Johnson, the performing and cultural arts program which celebrates and showcases the diversity of the arts and performing artists in Northeast Ohio. there and welcome to another edition of Wake Up and Live with the Arts. I am Sue Johnson, one of your co-hosts, along with my compadre over here, compadre, Chris Fortunato, our co-producer, co-host, and all sorts of good uh, all-around things that I he helps us minute, with. I thought for a minute you were calling me your compare. <laughs> no, darling, not okay, tonight. Just... And we hope that you will sit back, relax, and join us for this hour where we have an exciting program uh, showcasing one of our local performing artists, playwrights, author, and we'll introduce her in just a second right after I tell you about This Is the Show where we celebrate and showcase the diversity of the performing arts, artists, and cultural arts, not only in Northeast Ohio, but from several places around the country. So we like to highlight actors, other performing artists, singers, dancers, musicians, uh, poets, playwrights, as one of our guests is this evening. In fact, I'm sorry, don't let me play you cheap, darling, because you write plays also. I, I write. I'm not <laughs> writing plays yet. Okay. She writes. Okay. So without any further ado, let me introduce Pam's sister, Vicki Williams-Morris. You're going to hear about Pam as we continue our discussion this evening. And Kimberly Brown, she is an actor from... Uh, uh, Karamu, among other places, but very well known and respected at Karamu as an actor and director. Welcome. Thank you. Now, Miss Vicki Williams Morris, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome you to our show as a playwright and as an author and an actor because you have worked with Chris uh, in Porgy and Bess over yes. at the Beck Center. This is a nice reunion. Yes, and you and I worked together in a staged reading at the Arena Fest, uh, one of Jim Spriggs' plays a couple years ago, Terror on Biddle Street. Yes. Um, so I got to work with you then. But now you are here to um, talk about some of your other endeavors, the first one being the fact that one of your plays is being presented at this year's Joyce R. Whitley's annual Arena Fest. I think we're on about the 18th? I think it's the 15th. 15th. Perhaps we okay. should tell uh, those in the audience what the Joyce R. Whitley Arena Fest is. Oh, very good. Thank yeah. you, my dear. <laughs> okay. The Arena Fest, for those of you who aren't in the know, is an annual playwrights festival held at Karamu, the oldest uh, African-American theater in existence in the country. And its artistic director is Terrence Spivey. And each year since Joyce R. Whitley, um, she left us. She's gone on to another dimension, as they say. She was very active at Karamu, and they created this staged reading festival in her honor. So each year about this time, April, May, uh, various playwrights get to see their plays uh, performed in a stage reading. The playwrights come from uh, all over the country. A lot of the locals are represented, as is Vicki Williams Morris. Her play is being presented, and you are performing. Is that not? Not this time. Not no. this time, <laughs> just being a playwright. Right. So tell us a little bit about the play that has been submitted and accept it and will be performed this year. Okay, the title is Even the Blind Can See and it's based on a true story that happened here in Cleveland um, about a young African American man who was wrongfully accused of raping and robbing a white cancer patient. Uh, he served 13 years in prison and with the assistance of the um, Innocence Project uh, DNA testing cleared him. The, the funny thing about his case was that caught my attention is that out of the 13 years he could have been set free you know, out of the 13 years, 8 mm -hmm. years out of the 13, right. he could have been set free but he chose not to because he wanted he didn't want to be part of the uh, sexual offender program mm -hmm. because he knew he was an innocent man 
and he wanted to be released on those terms. Under those terms, right. yes. And yeah, Chris, you're, you're familiar with the Innocence Project yes, yourself? Yes, I am. That How started, does that work? That started at New York University Law School uh, by a professor named Barry Sheck. And uh, Professor Sheck uh, got into DNA testing, uh, using it, also critiquing it in, in, in times when prosecutors used it and, and the methods in, in using it were wrongfully used. But in many cases, particularly uh, in, in sex crimes involving rape, where identification is a key thing and uh, the identification could be sketchy, they've used uh, DNA to effectively determine if someone was guilty or not. It's also been used a lot of times in uh, death penalty cases. All the, all the men and women who are on death row in Ohio have the right to use uh, DNA testing, if, especially before it became prevalent. They feel that it could exonerate them. So it, it is uh, an excellent way of determining a lot of things in, in the criminal law, also in paternity cases. When I started doing those as a prosecutor, we didn't have the DNA test. Right, that's how that's, it knew Mr. It Simpson was responsible right. for bringing that into the and daily forefront. That's right, I yes. forgot. Yeah, OJ <laughs> did have some, mm -hmm. some uh, use of DNA there and the blood mm -hmm. of the Bronco and all the other things. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> But uh, the gloves did not fit, so he got to quit. <laughs> oh, good. That's terrible. <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> okay. So, and, and the title of this particular piece, Even the Blind Can See, what does that refer to? Well, when he was incarcerated, he had wanted, he had studied Braille. He wanted to. Braille, yes. Correct. Uh -huh. He wanted to teach the blind. Okay. And there's a parable, you know, parable to that because even the blind can see that he was an innocent man. Yes. So I worked those two pieces together in the play. That's okay. Good. And now uh, certainly uh, this will air after the current Arena Fest um, has occurred. Uh, but we, if people wanted to uh, get in touch with you about the play, perhaps to have it staged read for one of their performances, or they might be interested in a full production. Mm -hmm. How could they get in touch with you to find out more about how the, uh, even the blind can see? Okay, well, they can write me in my P.O. Box or via uh, email. Okay. P.O. Box is um, 6134, that's Cleveland, Ohio, 44101. Okay, would you repeat that a little louder? P.O. <laughs> Box 6134, Cleveland, Ohio. 44101. Okay, and Vicki Williams Morris. Correct. Yes, okay. Right. And what is your email address? VMOR75 at Ameritech.net. Okay, VMOR75 at Ameritech.net. Okay, and then as all our guests um, are reachable through us at the Wake Up and Lives Actors Studio as well. So you can always email us at wakeup4664 at AOL.com uh, if you want to reach a, one of our guests to find out more about them or if you are interested in having them perform at one of your special events. We'd love to see that happen. And of course, so we also have a lovely website, wakeupandlives.org. Yes. Where of course now we are a complete total 501c3 organization and a closely held uh, nonprofit corporation <laughs> under the laws of the state of Ohio. You're feeling due, very legal tonight, due, aren't you? <laughs> due, due to some of my uh, petty fogging, yes. Uh. Oh, yes. All right, Mr. Petty Fogging. Uh, you just <laughs> <laughs> this is very interesting, though. These two, uh, this the play you mentioned mm -hmm. about even the blind can see, and, and your other story that you uh, wrote as well are very interesting to me. Oh, yes. As a, from a, someone who's prosecuted and defended people. People, yeah. Now, Vicki, how did you and Pam, we're going to start talking about this tome, and I want our audience to see that this is the labor of love, all 500, some page, 560 60 pages of, <laughs> of story. And, you know, there's more that could be told. I mean, this is so fascinating. And this particular story that we are going to spend the bulk of our time talking about is the uh, published work of Vicki and her sister Pam called Pam I Am, A Felon's Story. <laughs> How in the world did this project get started? Well, um, it started back in November 2000. Our mother had passed away in October in uh, for me, it was more or less, I was dealing with a couple of things in my life. Uh, I was diagnosed with lupus uh, a few months prior and losing her. 
and I started getting attached to my mother. Uh -huh. He's my mother. So I started getting more attached to other things that should make a difference in life. And I was writing. I had written another play at Caramu. It, it made the ninth annual Arena Fest, but I didn't push that any further. And um, Pam was, um, she was very instrumental with my mother, just as well as me and my other siblings. And I asked her, I said, hey, can I, can I write your story? And she agreed. And years went by, and the thing about that was, I had worked on the story from 2000 to about 2003, and it really didn't have Pam's voice. And I didn't learn that until I went to a writers' conference in D.C., uh, the Hurston Wright Writers' Conference. And I came, I went there with a, you know, with this ass on my chest for super writer, <laughs> you know. And I knew there was going to be agents there, you know. So I was, I'm ready to publish this. And because for years I interviewed a lot of people affiliated with Pam, I interviewed Pam and, and pull her police records and everything. But the conversations, because we didn't live the same lifestyle, you know, it was it was kind of phony. Mm -hmm. So around 2003, Pam joined in, and she was going through issues in her life. She was um, um, going in and out of rehab. Uh, she she wrote a great portion of it when she was in the shelter. Uh, she. Um, Probably was incarcerated once or twice throughout the time we were, we were writing this. So we worked on this diligently until 2007, you know, so. Okay. So yeah. now it's your, this is your finished product then? Or, right. Uh, absent any more revisions or additions or anything else that you would plan to do with it? Well, once the publisher picks it up, they will okay. revise it again. Right. At one point, this manuscript was 708 pages. Wow. Yes. Mm -hmm. And even at 560 pages, it's a fast read. Perhaps we should back up uh, a little bit about Pam is your old, one of your mm -hmm. older sisters yes. out of a family of originally 10... Originally 13. Originally 13, 13 mm -hmm. siblings. And like many families, you put the fun and dis dysfunctional for your family in mm -hmm. some cases. A uh, lot of issues and... Uh, but a very supportive family. The brothers and sisters, fairly close in many cases, and um, mom and dad had issues in terms of their marital relationships. So, I mean, there's a lot going on. Pam, at an early age, had some life issues. She had some things that may have helped her step over the traditional edge, if we will, you know, for lack of a better term, so that she ended up, quote, getting in trouble as a teen. Right. And her trouble continued uh, as she went through her teen years and young adult, full womanhood. And uh, even now, Pam is working hard at living what we might consider as a standard or normal or regular life, and she still has challenges. One of the things that is so fascinating about this story is that um, this is a story that doesn't have a happy ending mm -hmm. yet, okay? It's a work in progress right. in terms of it coming thing. out with a happy ending about all mm -hmm. the things primarily Pam has gone through and that the family has been involved in, including you, mm -hmm. and um, you helped write this story to get it out <coughs> to the world. And I... I'm going to have to take some pride in this story because I, I did do a little editing with, on it. I've read it through. I am absolutely fascinated with it. And I, I personally absolutely believe it's got to go on at some point and become uh, a bestseller. And from there, I see it as a movie or a TV program. Uh, I'm saying this because if there are agents, publishers, you know, literary folk out there who might be interested in this kind of Real story, but full of high drama. Get in touch with Vicky at you, your your um, web your not your website. What am I trying to say? Your email address right. v m o r at what v m o r uh, seven five seven five at ameritech dot net. Okay, at ameritech. We'll put that up on the screen. Don't worry, it'll be up on the screen. You wouldn't have a part in there for like a mean white judge or prosecutor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, several. Yes, we do. Oh, several. <laughs> <laughs> One thing about this, when, when Pam joined in, she she kept it real. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when some judge or prosecutors or any attorney said certain things to her that stuck in her mind throughout the years, it was mentioned. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, you can, the the records of that of those uh, hearings may still be 
somewhere in the Justice Center in a court stenographer's uh, uh, archives because mm -hmm. they keep that stuff for a while. For, for a long time. Yeah. And th as we are laughing, yes, there are, mo like all life stories, there are elements of humor, elements of I don't believe this, elements of my God, how did she survive this? And this is the kind of story where you're really pulling for Pam. Uh, because you want good things to happen. You want her to recover. Uh, she has had issues not only with crime but with drugs and she's still working on those aspects of her life and all of us have issues. All of us right. deal with something right. and but her story is fascinating um, just because. And you brought an actor along, Miss Kim Brown, who is going to read uh, an excerpt from the story and what, what section are you going to read to us? The section that I was asked to read is actually chapter 22, which is titled Bones Back. Bones Back. And okay. additionally, there's a poem that I believe was written by Pam. Was it written by Pam or written, written by, by you? Or written by me. Pam. Okay. Oh, I'm you know sorry. what? I didn't want to divide the manuscript. Uh -huh. you know, you know, but I would just say we both wrote it together. Yes. You know, yeah. So uh -huh. I do it that way. So this, you are. The parts that Pam had written, you can hear my voice yeah. in it. The mm -hmm. parts that I've written, you can probably hear her voice in it. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a co-authored co um, piece of literature. Right. Yes, mm -hmm. and you can tell that it's flavored with, you know, both of their hearts, both of their souls uh, have been invested in, in this work. And so I'm, I'm excited about it. So would you like to start by read, read the poem? Certainly. It goes with, uh, is that go, that's the one that goes with Chapter twenty. 22. 22. Okay. Yes. Each chapter starts out with, or section. section. Each section. There is so much to this book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, each section starts out with an original poem and uh, down to earth, and it really, to me, it uh, is full of expression. So start with the poem if you would, huh? No problem. Okay. Rock bottom is not a place where your feet touch the ground, it's mean. Cruel and bitter, it's where no love can be found. Cold is not a reference to temperature of Fahrenheit or degrees. It's a feeling of rejection that knocks you to your knees. Oh, how I breathed in smelling salt of survival, breaking me down, holding me back until defeat's arrival. Not with ease, but with pain and agony deep in my breaths. I've paced the floor under rock bottom's terms, determined that I wouldn't be anything less. Oh my, okay. How, how did it happen? Tell us the backstory about creating a poem of such depth to go with each section. How did that come into being? Um, well, as an artist, I would say it come from here. Uh-huh. Right, and but each one pull you along from each section. There's four sections in the book, and that is from section two. And by the time it gets to that point, Pam had went through so much. Uh, just in section one, she was raped twice. Uh, one of the rapes, she was left for dead. She was buried uh, in Forest Hill Park in the blizzard of 76-77. Uh, and that is some compelling reading. As I, as I was going through trying to read and not cry right. at the same time, that. I mean, the whole thing is compelling, but there are certain sections that really, incidents, that she had to crawl that far, that long, before somebody came to her rescue. Right. Even now, the, the visuals are, you know, creeping up in my mind. Right. Yes. So okay. that poem uh, that Kimberly just read, um, by then Pam had went through, she'd been to jail several times, and she made several efforts to pull herself together. Uh, maybe got an apartment, everybody pitch in, the family with furniture and everything, and she... Um, she played the role that she had it together and the minute we thought everything was okay mm -hmm. she falls apart again so she was determined not to be part of rock bottom's terms and mm -hmm. so you know writing those poems come from within oh yes yeah. and Mm -hmm. It's so sad sometimes when you see sometimes that kind of traumatic event you can have when you're young like that could sometimes just influence the rest of your life. When you mentioned that, it reminded me of the of the movie Lady Sings the Blues with Billie Holiday mm -hmm. and and how her assault at, at such a young age uh, affected a lot of her life choices that she made that later devolved into, into drugs and, and other uh, activity, which is quite unfortunate. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the sad thing 
having represented people like that in court uh, too over the years is that we don't always address those issues when we get in there. We try to, but then when you become habitual through the court system, there are just sometimes uh, there are judges that just wash their hands of you and they don't want to handle it and they just figure you're, you go to Marysville or, or if you're man, one of the men's prisons. You have chapter 22, an excerpt thereof? I do. Let us turn the spotlight on you, my dear. Okay. Chapter 22, Bones Back. East 86 didn't change much, but then again, I didn't expect it to. The only thing that looked out of place was a dark colored car that was parked across the street for days. I remember thinking it was a matter of time before it was towed, hit, stolen, or stripped. Early one morning, Keith was in and out a lot running errands. Sugar kept the television up so loud you'd have thought she was at the movie theater. Even though Keith sold drugs from the front door, things were calm. I adjusted my pajamas and laid Kayla across my lap to comb her hair. She was a bright little baby and, may I add, cute. Even though the drugs were out of her system, she still suffered from seizures. It had been six months since she'd come into this world, and I still wasn't used to having a child. But whenever I combed her hair, we would bond. I felt a breeze and glanced over at the front door. Somebody slowly opened it. I didn't think it was Keith because the door swung slowly, and Keith usually burst in like he was a cowboy entering a saloon. I was surprised to see two men dressed in suits standing at the threshold, one white, one black, and they let themselves in as if I had invited them. The white one asked, is there a Betty Murphy here? I'm a secret service agent and he's a postal inspector. The other one looked at me, then Kayla laying across my lap. How old is she? He asked. I noticed his postal inspector badge in his hand. She's six months, I answered, trying to avoid eye contact. I knew I was in trouble. Ma'am, can we talk with you at the table? The secret servant agent asked. I laid Kayla down on the couch, and the two men took a seat at the dining room table. I noticed one of them had a briefcase. Do you know a Betty Murphy? My heart skipped a beat. I dropped my head even lower to keep them from looking directly into my eyes and said, no, I don't know her. The postal inspector showed me a picture of myself and after tossing it on the dining room table, he asked, do you know that lady in this photo? I kept my head down and said, she looks like me, but I don't know her. He pulled out another picture. It was a clearer, larger photo. I still denied knowing or being Betty Murphy. They sat quietly for a few moments. Finally, the same guy pulled out an even bigger copy of the same photo. Tears started rolling down my cheeks. They had me. I tried to fight back the tears, but I knew I was busted. I wanted to remain strong. The room seemed to spin as they told me I was being arrested for forgery, false identity, and grand theft. Whew, you know you're a hard person to catch up with, the Secret Servant agent said. We followed you to McDonald's one day and we were going to arrest you. <laughs> we blinked and you were gone. We know all about you. We've been watching you for two weeks, the Postal Inspector said. Your daughter is very pretty. You can get this out of the way while she's still young. He reached behind him and removed a set of handcuffs. Where are you taking me? Down to the main post office where you'll be fingerprinted. You have a lot of charges against you with the county. We'll turn you over to the state and the feds will see you after that. Here I go again. They read me my, my rights. Can I get dressed? I stay on the third floor. My clothes and shoes are up there. One of us will go upstairs with you. 
The Secret Service agent followed me. I kept looking back at him as I left the dining room. Everything flashed before my eyes. I couldn't believe I was busted. I thought I could take my last chance and break for freedom and found my feet headed toward the back door. After I made a couple of steps in that direction, the agent flashed his pistol and demanded, Don't try it! The postal inspector looked over at Kayla, who was still napping on the couch, and said, Ma'am, if you want to see your baby girl again, I advise you to cooperate. Visions of Kayla taking her first step, saying her first word, going through the terrible twos and adolescence, raced through my mind. Even though I had been neglectful, I loved that little girl. I didn't want to jeopardize her future, especially our future together. The agent allowed me to change my clothes. They led me in handcuffs to the dark car that I thought should have been towed. Well, well, kind of takes your breath away. And that's only a little teeny tiny a taste of Pam's story, mm -hmm. Pam's life. But I'll and say one thing, though. What? I think that the postal inspectors could use a little training from you in terms of they, they tend to use the same old lines every time. <laughs> oh, do they? Yeah, they, need, <laughs> they need some, you should write some more material for this. <laughs> <laughs> I just, and, and that was just one escapade that Pam got caught up yeah. in, and they finally found her. I still have to say, uh, even with the seriousness of her story, there is a lighthearted aspect because you do have to chuckle. Pam, out of all of her escapades, only did really hard time, was it once or twice? She, uh, you know, with Marysville. She was in Marysville three times. Three so, times, yes. yes. And for and she was in the hole a lot when she yes, was so there. One time she was in Marysville, she served five years there. Okay, now, yeah. So what she, do you know about the hole? Uh, after the show, I'll tell you how to do it. I mean, she says, these, she says these terms like she's down at the courthouse all the time. Hey, I told you, don't play me cheap. I've been around. I know things. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this show, this this uh, the show here, uh, mm -hmm. the the story. I mean, it, it's a for people who are in the social services. This would be good material to work from. People in the justice system. This would be good material to work from. People in the artistic community. My God, this is a beautiful piece to work from. And I want to touch on some of the things again to flesh out the story. Thanks for that beautiful yes. reading. Um, you know, notice that it's uh, was talking about this section has Kayla on her lap, her baby daughter. Right. Would you tell our our audience, um, Pam is the mother, uh, birth mother of four children. Right. Tell us that story for about your sister and the children. Uh, well, Kayla's her oldest, which is not her real name. No, not <laughs> her name. Everyone's names have been changed. Except Pam's. <laughs> Except for Pam's and mine. And yours, Even our yes. other sisters and brothers, they're, they're Everything has been, yes, everything has been changed <laughs> to protect just the like innocent. Just from Zimbalist <laughs> Jr. in the FBI. Yes. Now you know how old I am. Okay. Uh, ancient. Well, Go Kayla, ahead. Kayla yeah. turned to be a, a real success story. She, uh -huh. um, cla she was class. Uh, Valedictorian, mm -hmm. Victorian, and she got a full ride at Ohio State. Yes, oh, good. you know, so she's doing very well. She's studying criminal justice, and that—that's yeah. an example because you and I have spoken. And I, when I teach, I'm also among my many eclectic backgrounds. I'm a teacher, and she is an example of you become someone great in spite of your background, yes. and don't let your background be the cause of you not enjoying success. Yeah, right. So she is, is one of the family success stories. Break the cycle. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly. And she is majoring in criminal justice? Yes, criminal justice and women's studies. And women's studies. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds apropos. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and do you care to share the, the story about the other youngsters uh, that belong to That's part of the meat of the book. Okay. You know, she, she lost all four children. The, yeah, and, that's, you know. and we need to read the story to find out See, I, what that's all about, how she lost all four I of her children. I was wondering, and I don't know what year that actually happened, but I know now if they, a child is born that may have some type of contraband in its system, that they immediately take uh, possession, the social services takes immediate possession of the child. Right. And then each you have child to have she had, each case was different. Yes. Yeah. Kayla was born in the, uh, uh, I think, early 80s, I believe. 
And the, the youngest one was born in the 90s. And then they just took that child away from her. So right. there's, the, each, the system got more um, uh, strict. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. They, how, they're how quite cases, strict right. compared to, say, in the 80s now. That The hearings are, are almost immediate mm -hmm. down at the Metzenbaum home, and, and they and the courts are, are almost bound now to have these permanent custody hearings that I just think are, are extremely sad because you actually lose custody of your own flesh and blood, which can right. be very, very difficult to have to take. Mm -hmm. So the story of the children, so children's services would be interested in, in yes. the story right. as well. I mean, there's just so many aspects, facets, you know, to this overall story. And there's also the relationship of factors, because Pam has her share of romances, <laughs> <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> There, there are a lot of characters in this story, folks, and uh, you, you're able to keep track of the goings and the comings of, of the folks in this story, and we won't give away all the details, but Pam is um, uh, known for some romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. About how many do we recall altogether? Well, there are, I believe there's four that's highlighted in that book mm -hmm. strongly. Strongly, yes. Right, uh -huh. so... Um, well, I guess over a period of time, because the book is written from the 1970s to the year 2007. Mm -hmm. and, you know, a lot of us had relationships, you know, <laughs> in between. Span right, that span. Yes. Right. But of course. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the main four are mentioned, and uh -huh. they go out, they go with her throughout the book, you know. Yes. And they have their highs and lows. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is a character-driven story. It's dialogue-driven. I mean, I can't say, my, me personally, I'm sorry I'm biased, but I could, I'm in so in love with with you and Pam and the story, and I feel it's a story that should get out here. What is it that you hope to see the story do, ultimately? What's your dream about uh, Pam I Am? Um, well, my personal dream or the overall dream with the focus of the book? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> personally, we would love to see it develop into a movie, mm -hmm. see her life you know, go from beginning to end. And the book is so big, it'd be in another roots probably, but... Uh, <laughs> eight, 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 six, yeah. six uninterrupted yeah. nights. And there you go. <laughs> but overall, you know, I guess one of the missions of the book was to help people uh, who are going through the same thing Pam has gone through. Yes. You know, there's not always a happy ending, mm -hmm. but it's always an ending that with strength. Yes. This could be on the Lifetime channel, which I've also referred to as the Chick channel. You would. You and your so. sexist, chauvinist, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with you? I, I, we'll take whatever we can get. <laughs> Lifetime is fine. You, USA is fine. You talk about genders. You talk yeah. about diversity. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's wrong with genders, all three of them? <laughs> I mean, this is a wild and wacky man. I, well, you all know that. I'm going to tell you two for <laughs> We had our share already. Yes, but it, it, there is a lot of, of meat in there that is good for... Mm -hmm for a good series. A a nice absolutely, yes. and it's a story with heart. Like I said earlier, I mean, you do pull for Pam. Mm -hmm. uh, she's just that kind of empathetic person where you, you hope that uh, she succeeds, and it's not over. There's still yeah. time for, I don't know whether redemption's the right word, but you know, to experience success, because she's only 40. No, and anybody, no, she's 40. 48, she's, only, well, she's still only 48, okay? And so that means she's still got lots of time. And anybody who has survived the things what that she survived, has survived yes. and mm -hmm. still is on her feet, still has a sense of humor, still, and she does acknowledge that, um, you know, that it's a rough ride for her. Mm -hmm. But she hasn't given up. You right. know, she has weak moments. She has, perhaps, we don't know, relapse periods, but she keeps bouncing back. So I has guess that rubber rubber and glue thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, has your no. sister ever said why she makes these choices? You know what? She said it, and there's a poem in here called Stupid. You know, um, <laughs> I had to say, you know, but you read a book, a lot of things she did were just outright stupid. And you asked her, you know, and she'll tell you, you know, I, I've been a junkie all my life. This is what I know. I like getting high. It's my body. You know, so that I think that's what pulls at her because she knows society wants her and her family wants her to get herself together, mm -hmm. but she still wants to get high. So it's a seesaw effect. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that and the, the brain receptors have been changed as a result of the, right. of oh, the yes. previous abuse. Mm -hmm. Right. And as I but learned, you know, because I never, I never did. Uh, well, I'll be honest. I I tried a little marijuana, 
I tried a little cocaine, mm -hmm. never got hooked, just a little bit to get after somebody. He said, well, you know, you can't take advantage of me. I can smoke all your cocaine and smoke all your, your marijuana, yeah. and I still mm -hmm. won't give myself to you. Mm -hmm. And I left it alone. Mm -hmm. But there's some people, you know, they try and they can't get away from it. And mm -hmm. I think in her case, when she tried crack cocaine, which is a big difference between oh, cocaine, yeah. mm -hmm. um, she, for years she was trying to chase that first high. I understand that is what happens with mm -hmm. cocaine. Uh, they crack. call them in the street term mm -hmm. crack addicts. That yeah. what, after that first high, I guess they continue. Yes, it can be. Mm -hmm. If I can say, like from what I've heard from people who have said that to me and others, it's, it's said like an ultimate orgasm mm -hmm. in terms of, of its Put uh, potent uh, power. potency yeah. and just the the experience of that, which to me would be frightening. I think mm -hmm. to, yeah. to to try and, and go over that kind of precipice. Because I, I, I think I know how sometimes she feels. Cause I find life hard just normally, and I just can't imagine the things that people will then do to either mask their life but then have to take on other burdens that, that come about as a result of the addiction. Mm -hmm. And I correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that cocaine was her primary drug of choice when she was using... Was Actually, that? crack, crack cocaine. Crack cocaine right. was her primary choice as opposed to... I don't even know what some of the others are. Heroin and what are some of the others? Meth, 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 uh, speed. Crystal meth, uh -huh. speed, of course marijuana mm -hmm. uh, as well, but uh, the crystal meth can be very, very addictive. And the heroin today is is pure from when you grew up during the summer of love. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> you were... Uh, <laughs> Have course, you been testing these yeah. things? <laughs> no, 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 these are from my, my, my policeman friends when I prosecuted. Okay. They said that the heroin today, compared to the heroin that they had back in the early 70s, is, has been refined so well and so pure compared mm -hmm. to what it was like 35 years ago that it's extremely addictive. Okay. I mean, mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're looking at Sue and I, or Sue and me. No, you're whatever. looking Sue at me. And I? Oh, okay. You're looking at Sue and me. All right. Uh, I don't know why I get that one wrong. But when Sue taught at John Adams, she could never understand what the heck that smell was in the girls' room. I remember. That chalky smell? I didn't know what, no. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. I've had that. I've smelled that chalky smell. I was wondering what the heck, who, what kind of cologne is that, <laughs> I was my thought. Yeah, well, it oh. took me a long time. It took me a couple oh. of years before somebody <laughs> was able to tell me that's what that smell was when I was chasing girls out the bathroom. But anyway, so... <laughs> A little different from cigarettes. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I couldn't. I just couldn't figure it out. But in any event, for in a way, this sounds really strange. But fortunately, in a way, that Pam's choice of drug is is in a narrow range. That if she's going to do something, it's not all across the board uh, with some of the others. And the thing about it here again, another admirable uh, testimony to her endurance, her will to survive. She's held jobs. Now, she may not hold them long, but there's a, <laughs> there are um, uh, stories in here, segments that talk about her, um, you know, working Employment. on jobs. And she was a good worker. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I wondered, now, here we go. Let's, let's watch this now. Because I'm going to mess with Christopher. Mm -hmm. Remember I asked you if she were a Pisces at one point, her, her birth sign? Mm -hmm. Because Pam seems... That's water. Yeah, yeah, and they're, they're, they're conflicted. They go in two directions that they know what they should do, they want to do right, and then something flips them and they're just not able to do what <laughs> they know is the right thing to do. But she's not a Pisces, right. but she's, her, her behavior, her attitude is such that she does. She wants to do right. She knows when she's messing up. She's trying to change, and then it doesn't take much. She flips. Something comes up, mm -hmm. and she goes the opposite direction. So I think, is that a fair assessment at all? Or I, I think part of that is uh, Even though she's not a Pisces, I understand that. Right. right. You know, I don't really don't go by Zodiac I know you don't. astrology, yeah. but I know, I, I know I, I'm kind of literate to this, but being her sister, there's mm -hmm. codependency. Mm -hmm. You know, so throughout the book you will see too where sometimes we made it too easy for her. Okay, You yes. know, and there have been other times where she went through rehab, went through rehab, and as soon as she got out, she went back into the same environment. Mm -hmm. So that's part of that pulling, you know. Yes. So uh -huh. she she get uh she was part of the same friends and hanging around, you know, doing the same thing. You know, then we made it the family made it a little easy for her. Then there was points in the book where we 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 pushed her away. You know, mm -hmm. enough is enough. But you don't want yeah. a person to fall so far, you know. Right. So. Right. 
because she is your sister. Exactly. And you love her. Right. And she's a lovable kind of, of gal. So I've, right. I've known of people who went in places they probably never thought they would be chasing after people like that, trying to get them out. And, of course, then they run risk of, of possibly being arrested or, or hurt or injured in some ways, too. And it's, it can be a very, very difficult thing chasing after someone like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so on an uplifting note, uh, Pam is still working on striving and overcoming, mm -hmm. and Pam's story continues, and we can create a saga out of it. If any, if any television producer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, wants, wants to contact us, uh, we'd be delighted. And just for the record, um, you can contact Vicky at V M O R seventy five at Ameritech. Ameritech.net. If you want to find out more about this story, if you'd like to have readings done, or if you are a literary agent, we certainly would love to have to revise this again. Mm -hmm. Can I say two things? So? Oh, but of okay. course. <laughs> we do have, uh, first thing is, we do have an agent and a publisher interested. Hot you know, dog. nothing is finalized yet. Yes. And the second thing is, we were awarded the Higher Arts Council Individual Essence Award for 2007 for this manuscript. Um, I don't know if anyone knows what that means what, for our what studio audience. Is that again? The Ohio, which are the, the Ohio Ohio Arts Council Individual Excellent Awards. But Individual Excellence, Excellence Awards. Awards. Okay. And that was uh -huh. a for collaborative Effort. work mm -hmm. of nonfiction. Yes. So, Okay, well that, I was going to work that in, but thank you, mm -hmm. because that was important that we have an artist, a recognized artist by the Ohio Arts Council, so that should be an indication of the quality of this manuscript. And Kim, uh, as we do begin to wind down for this evening's segment, uh, we want to, again, thank you for your read, and you're a fine actor. You will be appearing, though this will air after the Arena Fest, you are directing and, and appearing or yes. directing? So you're doing both again. I know you, girl. <laughs> what are I you directing? Never, in, in never make it simple now, can I? <laughs> what, are you, what are you directing right now? The piece that I'm directing now is called Redemption of Allah Black. Mm -hmm. It is a very, very real kind of street drama mm -hmm. written by a young man who's originally from Houston, Texas and is currently in the MFA program at Ohio University. Mm -hmm. His name is Reginald Edmund. Okay. We uh, read for the first time last night. It was very well received mm -hmm. and uh, we'll go up again next week. Okay. The piece that I'll be appearing in is called Miss Rosetta and the Mount Calvary Missionary Club. Because I couldn't be in it because of my schedule. Oh, oh. it's the cutest thing. <laughs> yeah, it's and such a, it's a really Doug good Pratt piece. And Doug Pratt is directing Doug that Pratt's piece. directing. Oh, yes. uh -huh. And it's a lot of fun. fun. And yeah. I'm enjoying and, myself and, thoroughly. And yes. who are you playing then? Officially, I am playing the stage manager who will okay. read stage directions, and there is a possibility that I may be called upon to be Miss Rosetta. Okay. <laughs> what you know, I read for him for one day. <laughs> Did you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Which part? Uh, it was just filling my way around different spots. Different. Okay. 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 But it's, it's very funny. The church ladies. Okay. Yes. yes. It's normal. Oh, so, yes. It's yes. So Miss Norma She's Powell. one of our co-producers. Yeah. Yes. And, and if we don't mention Norma's name. Miss Norma Miss Powell. Miss Powell, y'all. Okay. <laughs> our local <laughs> diva. Uh, but of course, our grand dame of theater. And John Adams. <laughs> and Robert. John Adams. Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> we won. Uh, before, <laughs> while we finish being silly up here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we, we want to take just a minute as we wind down from discussing Pam I Am a felon story if our camera can pick that up a little bit um, and all 560 pages we're winding down from discussing that I don't want to forget to acknowledge uh, Pam who was unable to be with us this evening uh, because she was going to be part of the panel to help tell her own story and she does have some support in our audience this evening one of her counselors from one of her programs has joined us uh, to let Pam know how special she is, not only to us, but to her counselors and the other folks who work with her. Want to give special credit, recognition I should say, to uh, our new interns from Ohio Center for Broadcasting, Laura Staldler and, is it Stadler or Staldler? 
Stalder and Cassie Venorsky are joining our Dana Smith and Gerald Saunders, our uh, control booth director, uh, working with us. And they are all working with our senior videographer, uh, Lester H. Brown, Sr. And, of course, we have one of our resident playwrights, Ruby Fox, who is join us, joining us also. So I want to thank uh, the new interns for joining us. Hope they like us enough to hang out here for a while. And Hope thanks I to our regular folks. You didn't do too badly today, no, darling. I didn't have my usual Al Pacino, Dustin Hoffman, <laughs> hissy fit. Fit about anything. Yeah. Um, congratulations. It wears okay. well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, we want to thank our special guests. Uh, Vicki, I look forward to great things happening with you, and uh, with the story, and with Pam, and with you continued uh, theatrical success, my Thank dear. Mm -hmm. And with that, uh, stay tuned. I think we have a few minutes left. We are going to um, perhaps showcase a little special feature for you at the end of our show. But in the meantime, on behalf of Chris Fortunato and myself, Sue Johnson, uh, we want to end our show the way we always do. Be sure to wake up and live with the arts every day. Wake up and live. <laughs>